Good morning. Uh, I'm Dana Joya, the director of the Harmon Eisner Program in the Arts. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and it's my pleasure to, to introduce the first session in the Arts and Culture track. But first, I must give you your daily update. Uh, there's a new time now for what is the Facebook effect. Uh, it's 10.30 a.m. Tuesday, so it's, it's after this, and it'll be in the Pepke Auditorium. There's a new time for Can We Rethink Consumer Behavior Going Green in America, which is now at 2.30, also in Pepke. So Facebook, 10.30 in Pepke, uh, Rethink Consumer Behavior, 2.30 in Pepke. There's a new room for the Twitter effect on movies and culture. Uh, it will actually be in this room at 2.30 uh, versus the room that's listed. And there's a new room for uh, Is America Still the Land of Opportunity? It'll be in the Coke building in the Booz Allen Hamilton room. So Twitter here at 2.30. Uh, the Land of Opportunity has been moved to Coke. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce two of the most important people in American theater, the playwright John Guar. Where? 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 Excuse me. Where? Where? You travel all this way. Okay. <laughs> As I was saying, John Guare. That's uh, right. And uh, the, the... I was once at a, at a question and answer, and somebody said, Mr. Guare, I'd like to ask you a question. I said, it's pronounced Guare. She said, I pronounce it Guare. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> well, as, as, as someone named Joya, I guess I should, I'm very sensitive to this. And then Kerry Perloff, who is the artistic director of ACT. Uh, these, we got the Bay Area here, it's amazing. Uh, it, you know, uh, those of, you know, of us who are longtime theater goers can probably remember back to when uh, John Guare sort of hit the New York theater world in 1971 simultaneously with The House of Blue Leaves, which remains, I think, one of the finest American comedies, uh, simultaneously with his, uh, his book uh, for uh, Two Gentlemen of Verona, you know, which you know, played on Broadway and every other musical theater uh, in America. It was followed uh, uh, a little later you know, by suddenly seeing him as the screenwriter uh, in Louis Malle's uh, Atlantic City, for which he had an Academy Award nomination. And uh, then Six Degrees of Separation, you know, which, you know, one of the, I think, the canonic contemporary plays in the United States. He's a comic writer whose revelation of human character and, and extraordinarily complicated situations that humans find themselves in the poses, uh, uh, you know, which, which lock them in, I think, is almost immediately apparent you know, in, in his work. Uh, and, and has really made him one of the, the, the people that I think is revived again and again, uh, you know, and uh, something, you know, uh, where, you know, you can see these plays almost as, you know, as contemporary classics. Uh, Carrie Perloff is somebody, you know, I think I first heard about from my mentor at Stanford, uh, Herbie Lindenberger. He was one of his students. So every time I talked to him, he would say, Carrie Perloff does this, Carrie Perloff do, you know, <laughs> does that. And then in, uh, she was born in Washington, D.C. Uh, she uh, went to Stanford and then went to Oxford. And she went to this small theater in New York City, which I'm sure some of you know, the classic uh, stage company in the village, which I think per square foot is one of the best theaters in the world. Uh, then 17 years ago, she moved to ACT, where she has been the artistic director ever since. Uh, those of you who do not know oh, wow. the American Conservatory Theater, it is one of the, uh, I think, foundational theaters in the United States. It has extraordinarily high level of production. I mean, to a degree where that's, it is the preferred venue that Tom Stoppard has for, for the American premieres of his plays. And it also is a theater, which is a true conservatory, that it has a, an acting school along with it, it and, and develops a company of actors, people like Denzel Washington, Annette Bening, Winona Ryder, uh, Danny Glover, and our own Anna DeVere Smith are graduates of this school. And, you know, and it represents, I think, the, the nonprofit theater in the United States at its finest. Now, one of the, what we wanted to talk today about is, and I'm going to pontificate for about two minutes, is theater as one of the great civic art forms in the world. Theater as we now know it uh, was developed at the same time that Athenian democracy uh, was developed. It was, in a sense, the forum for which the different uh, tribes, the different peoples that found themselves in Athens, saw 
the, the kind of issues that they lived with literally dramatized on the stage. And again and again, in, in periods of great civilization, you know, theater has been at the center of sort of developing and articulating what social consciousness is, uh, what individual uh, existence is uh, in a complicated society. The United States has an extraordinary uh, theatrical world. There are probably more theaters in the United States than any other nation in the world, perhaps not on a per capita basis, but certainly on a total basis. Uh, these theaters are fundamental parts of the communities in which they, they find themselves, both the commercial and the non-commercial theater. But we're in a period now where their impact on society seems to be declining. For the first time uh, in the tracking of these statistics, the attendance of, a, of live spoken theater in the United States fell below 10%. Uh, last year, and even musicals, which have been been growing and growing, are now beginning to decline. It seems that uh, for a variety of reasons, economic, educational, cultural, logistic, that you know, theater no longer commands the kind of, of public participation that it once had. Uh, on top of this, we are in the country which is the global centers uh, for the TV business, for the movie business. Uh, actors, playwrights, you know, are, are torn in, in, you know, in different ways. And what I, we wanted to talk today with these, with these two leading practitioners uh, is what is the future of live theater in the United States? <laughs> okay. And you thought yesterday's economic session was depressed. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to be cheerful, John. No. Because it's so early. No, I just think it's... Theater is, I'll tell you something, I've been on panels like this. I started being invited on panels in about the late 60s at the O'Neill Center up in Washington. And the topic was always the future of the American theater. And I've been on, about every five years I'm on a panel that says, what is the future of the American theater? And the numbers are always going down, and it's always dire. And then something comes out of the blue, out of left field, that uh, rescues the theater for another bit of time. People find a new way of doing something. But I would like to talk to, uh, to Carrie here. I mean, I'm, I'm so, I worked with Carrie last year, and I had a great experience at her theater. And uh, she's involved in such a sensational situation right now where the theater is not some ivory tower removed from the city, but is an integral part of the city. Talk about the Tenderloin. This is great. He can moderate. Yeah. He can speak. This is why no, we I love want, John. No, it's a conversation. I just want to. Yes. And I mean, it's so my, my, great my Chris, that Rocco's here because this is our pitch for the NEA too. Yeah. yeah. And also the also right for, for, for profit Rocco's theater. Yeah. This is Rocco Landisman, who is yeah. the, the Doge of um, of, yeah. of arts money. Yeah, 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 the Doge. So be very, so very nice to him. Be very nice. Yes. And his wife Debbie. Him. Yes. That's right. No, yes. I was saying to Dana, two things struck me so much just yesterday at this conference that are sort of germane to our, I, I think, our thinking about this big, you know, ecology of the theater. One is, um, was the head of NPR talking about public media, and the other was uh, uh, Tom Friedman talking about sustainability, and I thought, uh, the, the, the crisis in theater in this country has always been that we honestly believe if it were really good, it would pay for itself. Um, and that's because we're a Puritan country and people fled the theater in England to come here where there was no evil theater so we could start over as, as a moral universe. Um, so those of us who make theater have always sat on the odd fringes of culture thinking, why are we not central to the discourse as, I mean, I started out as an archeologist, so ancient Greek drama was what I began with and I always thought theater was the center of the polis. You worked on it for a year you created a piece that was about big ideas, gorgeously produced, and the whole community came together for one day and celebrated it and paid for it. And so I was sort of shocked when I actually landed in this field by completely the back door and realized that, that unlike ballet and symphony and opera, which everybody knows are sort of complex, labor-intensive art forms that need training and virtuosity and nourishment and support, Theater, because it has a commercial correlate, was considered um, uh, you know, unsuccessful if it didn't pay for itself. And I'm in that loathsome field called the nonprofit, you know, which is the only thing we've ever lived up to in our profession is that we haven't made a profit. <laughs> you know. So I also thought it was very sad that we defined ourselves in the negative. The only thing we stood for is that we didn't make a profit. Um, 
And I have thought about this a lot in my time. I mean, I've been running a theater since I was 25 years old and thinking, um, what, well, if we're not, not making a profit, what are we making? Why are, why are we doing this thing that seems so important to us? And why do we have a national endowment? And why is it so beleaguered? Why do we have to fight to, to uh, um, articulate the need for theatrical culture to be at the center of our philanthropy and thinking in, in our culture? So, you know, as I was listening to these talks yesterday, I was so heartened that people finally realized that journalism isn't going to pay for itself either. <laughs> <laughs> And that there is another way to think about it if what you're interested in is not just the short-term bottom line, but where is the next John Guare going to come from? And that's the real question, right? How do you nurture an art form over time such that a culture can reflect back on itself the metaphor of its own time? That's what theater is. It's a place to go and experience, not in realistic television terms, but in some kind of heightened terms, a way of seeing your own uh, community. And so what we've tried to do at ACT is y y find a way that that space, that theater space, is part of a broader cultural dialogue in that city. What's very difficult, and we really, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about it at this whole conference, is it's part of a much bigger ecology. And now that arts are not taught in the schools anymore, and kids, there is no reading list whereby you can assume that when you produce anything, Oedipus Rex, The Glass Menagerie, Long Day's Journey, and Tonight, that anybody will have read it, because uh, that's the truth now in, 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 in education. As producers and artists, we not only have to think about how do we create work that we care about, but how do we educate an audience to want to commit to, to being part of that work over the long term? That's the big... I was, I was, you know, but we talk about the not-for-profit theater and theater having to pay for itself. And I think when, when we talk about the future of the American theater, we're talking about, in a sense, three different theaters. We're talking about the not-for-profit theater, which Carrie <laughs> represents, and Lincoln Center, and, and uh, Playwrights Horizons, and the Goodman, Steppenwolf in Chicago, and Seattle Rep. Because in a sense, America does have a national theater, and it's a chain of regional theaters all around, the 200 regional theaters all around the country. That's our national theater. But then we talk about the commercial theater, which is there to make a buck. And then there is that weird confluence between those two worlds. And what always amazed me was a number of years ago, while they were still alive, Bernie Jacobs, who was one of the, one of the men who ran the Schuberts, uh, Bernie Jacobs and Jerry Schoenfeld, who are now theaters. And uh, I said to them, I said, you know, I, I said to Bernie, I said, you make so much money. I mean, this is, why don't you develop a workshop, you know, to develop new talent. What, you know, what, what do you do about that? They do have a great Schubert Foundation that is one of the great backers of it. But I said, why don't you have a workshop specially designed to build new talent? And Bernie said, he said, we do have a workshop. We call it London. Oh. And, oh. And what was astonishing about we that, is that, total is, colonial that so, is so that different. so much of our theater uh, Today, which is you know which which is coming to New York, like Reds, which won the Tony this year. Red uh, singular. Red, that's right. Red singular. Um, uh, started came from the Donmar Warehouse, which is a government-sponsored theater, and uh, then was picked up and paid for itself in its in its limited run on Broadway. But uh, I think if somebody, I wonder what the life of that play would have been had the American writer brought it to an American theater. I don't know. The weight would have mm -hmm. been amazing. What really irritated me was, uh, it was jealousy. It was just out of pure jealousy, of which there was just a little bit in the American theater. <laughs> and uh, the day in 2003, whenever that was, that uh, we started bombing Iraq, started bombing Baghdad, that very day that it was announced, David Hare, Sir David Hare, leading American playwright, uh, leading British playwright, <laughs> leading British, British, British playwright, and Stephen Daldry, a great director uh, of Billy Elliot and The Hours and a great theater director, went to Nick Heitner uh, at the National and they said, look at the papers today. We're dropping bombs. We want to make a play of this. We don't know what it is, but we want to make a play to it and will you commit to it? And Nick said, yeah, OK, start writing the play today. Follow, the, follow what's happened. Follow the modern history. Now, there was a theater producer who said, I don't know what you're going to come up with, but I trust you guys. We'll do something. And let's plan for it in three years. So just give it a, a three-year period and stop off at that, at that time. And uh, what the, the jealous part of it was is that the New York Theater Workshop then did a reading of it, which I was played one of the senators in it. 
And because I was just curious to see how this play worked and read, and it was wonderful play, modern historical mm -hmm. document that will tell us what, what life is like, what it's like to be alive at this time. And uh, the fact that it came out of England, out of an English-supported theater, that there was no, there was no American theater that had the vision to do that simple thing, to say to two people, let's make a play about this. Now, it's not that we have to uh, cover every historical event and make a play out of everything. Every, not everything has to be a documentary. But this is a very, very key point uh, in our history. And uh, so when we, they talk about where are the new playwrights, where are the new actors, where are the new directors, where are the new playwrights, they are there. They are there. My question is the future of the American theater, as always, as it does in 1968 when we were talking about uh, the first time I was on a panel that says wither the American future, and that's with an H, not W-I-T-H-E-R, uh, um, was where are the new producers? Where are the people who are going to see this is how we're going to get something on stage. This is how we're going to take this idea, this script, and find a route for it to, to appear on this specific stage. You know, but a, a young writer, if they're writing for the live stage, you know, learns the craft of live stage versus screenplays or, or uh, television well, scripts. Well, let, let me interrupt you just because you learn the craft of writing, but you only learn writing when you're writing in front of an audience. Yeah. And that's the key thing. You can write as much as you want in, in this classroom. And it can be brilliant, but until the playwright well, this, has the That's exactly the question I was about to ask, which is, which is that, you know, how can a young playwright actually get that experience right now in the United States? The first thing you have to do is read a few plays and see a few no, plays. No, 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 Dana's know. asking about something else. Dana, no, no, I know. Yeah. But uh, this is how we work together. It's never matter to carry. No, 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 because, I mean, uh, you know, the... the, the the reason John became the writer he is is that, is that through production, through seeing it in front of an audience over time, it's an experiential art form. It's not a classroom art form. It's, it's a, you have to be a person of the theater to write for the theater. But I think one of the things that's happened is there's a kind of um, disdain for um, a, a, any tradition. And, and, in, and the only funding that exists in this country in the theater is for uh, new plays. And so the notion, there are, I direct at the O'Neill a lot, which is a, a workshop thing for new playwrights. And most of those are writers who've never read anything written before 1980. So if you've never read Brecht and you're trying to write a play that has a chorus or, you've, or a, a political agenda and you've never read Sophocles or you've never seen Lorca, but you want to write something that's poetic, and, you know, you're trying to start from square one in an art form that has deep and ancient and extraordinary roots. I, I think that's a huge problem. And it's because the theaters around this country that used to do great classical theater, the Guthrie Arena Stage, ART, have all sort of but, abandoned but that. But even, even if you've got a, a superb classical education, you know, you need to go to this, this school of hard knocks of actually mm -hmm. putting well, act, okay. live actors right. in front of when a stage I, and an audience. Tell them about your cafe chain. I, I got out of Yale in 1963, uh, and I was a playwright. I had, had a degree that said, I was an MFA, that I was a playwright. And I'd written a lot of plays, and I got out of there and I didn't know what what to do. I got I didn't know what I was gonna what I was gonna do, where I was gonna go. Because even then off Broadway was too big a dream. Off Broadway was just and the start was just too mammoth a place. How do you how do you even get on off Broadway? And I was walking down Cornelia Street, which is a street I had never been in in Greenwich Village, a little diagonal street that runs off Fourth Street connecting Bleecker Street. And I was just w walking around, probably looking for a place to live or something. And I saw in a, a storefront, it's a Cafe Chino, Lanford, uh, The Madness of Lady Bright by Lanford Wilson, a hand-painted sign. And I went in, and there was this world. It was like an attic in hell. It was filled <laughs> with Christmas trees and pictures of Maria Callas and Jean Harlow and, uh, you know, and, 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 and axes. And it was crazy. It was just, it was in, and behind the bar, the coffee bar, was this uh, big swarthy Sicilian. And there was a stage in the middle. And I said, I could fit here. <laughs> and at the end, the actors passed the hat. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and that was that. And I came back the next day at 6 p.m. I heard that Chino, this man Chino, who should, in a sense, be remembered as some model for the future. <laughs> uh, he was a very, as I said, a very bulky, burly Sicilian who worked as a steam presser in New Jersey. 
uh, from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. every day. And he'd then put clothes up, you know, you know clothes, turn off his steam presser, get on the ferry, come over, uh, take the Weehawken ferry over to the village, walk to the cappuccino, put his key in, and open up his true life, his true world, where he made this place of magic. And there he was. And uh, it was just a guy who ran a coffee shop and put on plays at that point. And I went to him, and he had sort of an African shirt on, and he was, you know, washing up dishes. And I said, I said, uh, Joe Chino, he said, I said, I'm a playwright. He said, I'm not doing any plays, except I'm doing plays written by Aquarians. <laughs> it was your and day. And I said, but I'm an Aquarian. <laughs> and he said, prove it. And I took out my driver's license. And he said, February 5th, I've been looking for you. And he took out his charts and said, you open May 20th, and you run. And look, you get a week's extension. You run for two weeks, and you get a week's extension. Welcome to the Chino. Well, that was my introduction to the New York. I mean, if I had been born in October, I don't know what. And I'm February 9th. It's perfect. So our but, destiny is in the stars. Huh? Our destiny is in the stars. Well, but you know oh, what? It was a that was a time. Where, the point I'm getting to is that it's a great and I at that working at that little theater, I met other guys. In, you know, not many women working there at that time. Just one, Sally Ordway. There was a, I met the other guys, uh, Sam Shepard and Lenford and Lanford Wilson and uh, Leonard Melfi and Terence McNally, and we all were just working in these storefront theaters. And uh, I remember my father came to see this play of mine at the, uh, you know, he came in May, you know, with his daughter. And what he was shocked about is, the play ran about 40, you could have about 45 minutes of time. And my father was shocked, he said, because at the end of it, the actors got off, whom he knew, my friends, and we helped, we passed the hat to, you know, pay for expense and car fitting. And my father was aghast, he said, you went to Yale and you're passing the hat. <laughs> you know, it was, he said, I've got an idea. I've got, he said, why don't you write a hit musical and then you can come back here. <laughs> I said, you're so stupid, leave me alone, you know. Little knowing that he was right. <laughs> Which I would find out actually when I wrote a, a musical for, a new, for, a, for Free Shakespeare in the Park about uh, five years later that... Uh, uh, you know, that went on to win the Tony. It was just a crazy experience. But uh, that allowed me to have a life as in, the, in the not-for-profit theater. But uh, the fact of the matter is, the nightmare today is, is where do we find our chinos? Where do we find the place where we can do a play for passing the hat, where we can make the scenery ourselves? and put it on and get a full house and play for three weeks and hear an audience every night mm -hmm. respond. And you learn to write for an audience. You learn to an audience coming and you're just saying, why do they hate that? Why are they bored? Why do they like that? You know, where you learn in front of a living audience. Now to do the nightmare, for this, I mean, a friend of mine, was a, it was, it, to do a workshop of a play for a reading can cost anywhere from $50,000. And yet, you know, I, I think because ACT is also a school, I look at these 20-somethings who are in our graduate school and I think, you know, I don't know that that's the issue. I think young artists are always going to generate material and they're always going to find a way to, to put it on. You know, our students are uh, uh, unbelievably generative and, and you walk into that building at 11 at night and they've found a corner where they're doing their cabaret and, and, and producing. I think young actors are much more generative than interpretive artists than they used to be. I think the bigger issue is is sort of what the relationship is to the larger culture. I think the artists are, are going to make the work because they have to make the work. The, the, the distribution network is a but problem. How do you, <laughs> but how do you think about writing? I, I don't think that you can, just because a play has large themes, some people write a play and they'll say, well, it's about the Holocaust, so therefore it must be good. Just, I mean, that's the nightmare. If I, if I write a big idea, it'll automatically be good, rather than writing about my life as a child, life with my parents. I mean, there is a, uh, a young writer who, I mean, this is how, how people come out of the blue, where we're constantly being surprised. There's a young writer named Annie Baker. Somebody said, you've got to go see this play, Playwrights Horizon, Circle Mirror Transformation. And I went to see it last uh, fall. And, and I didn't read anything about it. And I went to see it. And it was about six people on stage. And they were doing act, and I realized the plot of the play was going to be six weeks of acting classes in Vermont. And I said, "Let me shoot myself now. I can't get." 
And the play was about the universe. The play ended up, because it was so intent about the people in that town, about the specifics, that it became enormous. It became life in America today. This woman then wrote another play, again at a small theater called the Rattlestick Theater in Waverly Place, which is done by these heroic people who <laughs> raise money in this little 199-seat theater in Waverly Place. And she did another play called The Aliens, which is just about three kids talking by, by a garbage dump. Uh, be behind, a, 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 behind like a Starbucks. And, and I go, oh, again, it was about the world. I mean, people come and they suddenly give you a whole new way of seeing life. There was a musical this year by Michael Friedman called Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson that has been developed in theaters all over the country at the, uh, the Mark Taper in, uh, in Los Angeles, I think in Chicago, and now it's, a, it's playing in, in New York with the public. And it's just the best musical I've seen in a couple of years. Because it's so weird with a young star, a guy named Ben Walker, who's just going to be a big star, who already is. Uh, uh, but it's too weird to be a commercial show. No people, they don't, so people don't know what to do with it. However, you see that, and you know that the form is, is given new life, that it is. Uh, so that's what you have to live for. I know, for me, contests are remarkable things. Because that's where contests, there are so many contests. The things that are good about today that didn't exist when I was beginning was the amount of contests there are today. There were no, no contests before. Now, there's a thing called the Kessel Ring Prize. And I remember I was a judge in it. And to reach into a box and to pick out of a play, this is now 20 year, 18 years ago, uh, Ange, a play Angels in America by Tony Kushner. And to read that for the first time, he said, wow, this is fantastic, and to see the way that plays were just passed around. And plays have an underground life mm -hmm. where plays are really passed around. And to get that next jump from there, to find the producer that will say, yeah, I'm going to do it. The nightmare when I was talking about the confluence between not-for-profit theater, like the Rattlestick, which is a new version of the, uh, the Cafe Chino, and the, uh, the Golden Theater on Broadway, where uh, Reds was transferred, Red was transferred to from the Donmar in government-supported theater in, uh, <laughs> in London. Uh, it, that's that... That's that foggy thing. How do we make, how do we get a play that can play for it? How do we put on a play that people want to see that will pay for itself? Jim, Jim Houghton, who runs the Signature Theater, a brilliant theater on 42nd Street, uh, that just does one season devoted to one playwright, and Tony Kushner's next season. And he has got, for the past five years, Time Warner, to underwrite every seat, costing him $20. So they're packed every night with young people. I went to... Why numbers are declining, as Dana said, is that it's too expensive. I mean, of course, seven, to see a little play at Playwrights Horizons upstairs in the studio last week, I went, it cost $70 to see. Well, luckily, I could, and I wanted to see, this was a play with Edie Falco, directed by a, 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 by a young a British writer, directed by this wonderful woman, Ann Kaufman, that I was working, I'm really interested in. And, but I just said, holy Christ, $70, you know, a lot of, and it was not, the audience in that theater watching it was us in this room today. It was not people, it was not young people, it was not people in their 20s and 30s, the next generation. So it's economics are barring so many people from... It's not to yeah. see it. Can, can, I, I want to ask you, this. we're talking about the development of new work, you know, the de training of new, of new dramatists. What does it take to sustain a repertory theater. I mean, both, you know, there's, you've done it in the Greenwich Village with CSC, and now on a much you know, larger scale at ACT. What are the particular challenges that you face of, you know, of, a, of a season which mixes the old and the new, which is trying to bring the classics back to life, bringing foreign plays mm -hmm. into, into English? Well, you have to be relentless, and you have to, I think, the only way to do it is to think in the very long term about what do you dream of for this audience 20, 30, 40 years down the road? You know, I mean, when I was hired at ACT, I was 32 years old and I knew nothing. And this theater, you know, had just collapsed in the Loma Prieta earthquake. So I was an archeologist, that much felt comfortable to me. It was a ruin, <laughs> lay in ruins. But, but um, you know, it was an enormous theater with a school. It, it had fallen in really terrible times. And the only thing I could really think of is, here it sat in the Bay Area, right? In this extraordinary community where people were hungry for knowledge and self-knowledge. You know, the Bay Area is where you go to do continuing education. Everybody's studying Sufi mysticism and cooking and like this. It's like this all the time. 
Um, and, and I thought, all right. And there I was in a theater that looked like a Broadway house. I mean, it is a Broadway house. And I was the strangest person to hire because that isn't what I do at all. And I kept saying to them, you're hiring the wrong person. I don't hire television stars. I don't believe in it. I don't do that kind of thing. I'm interested in the repertoire. I'm interested in uh, unusual kinds of literature. And I learned two things. One is I had a cataclysmically terrible first year where I got picketed by the Catholic Church. And <laughs> it was, you know, I was caught in every crossfire politically that San Francisco, which is a very ghettoized political town, can have. And what I learned in the end is, A, you have to keep putting yourself out there visibly. Um, and B, you have to answer every letter you get. I got 700 hate letters when we did The Duchess of Malfi. Um, it was a rather scabrous production of The Duchess of Malfi. And so I answered every one. And I realized that ultimately. What did you say? I said, I'm so thrilled you came. And, I <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so sorry you hated it. But uh, uh, you know, and, and it raised a lot of really interesting questions. Um, that production, it was Robert Woodruff doing his sort of Camille Paglia version of Jacobean drama. It was actually really interesting. And now people have t-shirts that say, I survived the Duchess of Malfi, all these years later. And that, what I found is that was a way of bringing this community together in a sort of culture of argument, which is what San Francisco likes. You know, well, argument this, is well, good. Well, this leads me to, I think, a, a really important question, uh, which is, what is that noise off stage? Uh, <laughs> is the, the difference? Television, movies are now global industries. Pop music is a global industry. Even American films are not even made for the United States anymore, but for a global marketplace. Where theater is in one place right. at one time with right. live people and a live audience. What does it mean to a town like San Francisco to have that as a part of its, its so urban culture? So that's culture? the challenge. I mean, the, the upside is you can actually have a real dialogue with a real audience over a long period of time. That's the thrilling part. So I know that audience now, you know, and they will tell me when they love it, when they hate it. They st we do post-play discussions. 500 people stay and argue about everything, you know. Um, I mean, when we did John's play, Rich and Famous, you know, I remember this post-play discussion with this big question about celebrity in America and why was that so important that was raised by his play. Um, it, so it is, in a sense, very local. And, and by being local, as you said about Annie's play, if it's really rich, it will also be very universal. So you, then you have to think, well, um, what are the ways to engender that dialogue? And I think the hardest thing about a young audience, it's not just money. You know, I have two teenage kids. They'll pay a lot more to go to a rock concert than they would to go to a play. So the question is timing. You know, when you have everything at your fingertips and you can iTunes anything and TiVo anything and whatever, the theater says, you want to see John's play, Rich and Famous at ACT, you have to come Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. You have to make that curtain. You have to make that commitment, right? That is not a rhythm that anybody under 25 is used to doing. So we did this thing. I mean, there are a lot of ways you can try and do it. I asked my daughter, who's 21 now, what would make her want to go to the theater? So partly it was price. Partly it was that she wanted it to be general admission so she could sit with all her friends. She didn't want to have to decide till five minutes to eight whether she was actually going to come or not, and if she was, who she was going to sit with. So we took our second balcony. And it's called 10 Up, and all the tickets are 10 bucks, and it's all general admission. And our beautiful Nubile MFA students serve drinks, so that's an added incentive, you know. Um, but, um, and, and it's been really interesting to see how that works. You know, well, think, at the same time, I don't think you have to dumb down the material. And the most important thing we can do is to try and have the highest expectation of our audience that we can have. And I think, that, I think a lot of the future of the theater involves the university. I think the university is going to be a sanctuary place. Oh, for John, the, for that is proven to be so not true. You don't think so? Oh, <laughs> listen, Stanford, right? Here we are, a lot of Stanford people here. I went to our, uh, my August alma mater and said, we have this great MFA program at ACT, and it's impossible to sustain a graduate school without an undergraduate school anymore, and Stanford has no graduate work in acting, and, and so it won't be a threat to anybody. How about it? And the president of Stanford said, it's a great idea. We love it. Go talk to the provost. And the provost said, it's a great idea. Go talk to the drama department, where it stopped dead. Why? Because they are theorists. And they said to me, you mean we'd have to do plays? I said, I know we're so bourgeois, we do plays. We've had different, we've had different no, this is true. It's, it's well, big issues at Harvard, big issues. I mean, at the big, at the schools with well, money Princeton, and endowments. Princeton, a little bit. Princeton is, I'm having a terrific experience yeah. right through right now. But I'll tell you, there are also things like here in Aspen, there's even a great uh, Julia Hansen, who lives here in Aspen, is, Julia? has created a, uh, 
where she, I, I became involved with this a couple of years ago, where she's developing young playwrights from uh, all the drama, uh, the drama, uh, graduate drama centers around America, and uh, and bringing artists out, bringing young playwrights out but here. But for instance, here's what would change the universities. If in these distribution requirements that universities have, when you have to take three science classes, three humanities classes, if you had to actually see in your whole time, in four years at a university, if it were a requirement to see three cultural events, that would make a difference. Three? You can graduate. Listen, you can graduate. My two? daughter is at Harvard. I asked her friends, do any of you go to ART? Have you been to? You know, these are smart. Engaged people, it is not considered a value of the university system to be culturally literate. So you can graduate with a great degree from a major American university and not know how to watch a dance piece and not have ever been to the theater. And uh, or in my and, case at Yale, was as Kim Rosenstock was here, that it was a, that for the last number of years I asked the class, and none of them have read Madame Bovary or seen a Marx Brothers movie. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> so you know that's. But I'll tell you something, I think, this is one of the things we always, the theater, what we're talking about is fear and danger and all, and I just want to talk, I, I, just, I just suddenly was thinking about something just before this started, we're talking about the future of the American theater and how, how we have to protect the theater. There's something we have to face up. The theater might die. In the second century BC, there was a play by Terence who was, you know, the real hit playwright, the Neil Simon, you know, real smash hit comedy playwright, and his sixth play, his last play, uh, ended, and he sailed off and vanished, drowned at sea, whatever. We, nobody knows what happened to him. But after that, the emperors and the government said, you know what, 25,000 people will come to attend. Theaters only, they would build a theater, they would fit 25,000 people, and it would be up for four days, and then it would be dismantled. There was no permanent theater. They started in the first century building for the first time, stone theaters, permanent theaters, which are still there in Rome and around the empire. And they put in those, they put in those theaters plays that were written by government-sponsored playwrights <laughs> who would write plays espousing uh, government propaganda. And the audiences started staying away. And then they started putting on only, uh, it ended up in the gladiator Romans and the Lions, but putting on bloody battles like world, you know, world, world wrestling, and uh, and and great spectacles with great, you know. So the the mind went out of it because the, the what was dangerous for the government at that time was the collision of. Uh, of all classes, 25,000 people, all classes coming together. That was a revolutionary thing, where the slaves and the masses, everybody was there in one place, watching the slaves, as in Terence's play, make fun of the masses. If we've seen funny thing happen on the way to the forum, you know the works of Terence and Plautus. Uh, when Ter what's, this is what strikes me, and I'll get to my point, is that in the second century, when 160s, so or when Terence vanished, and his last play opened and, cl and then closed, there was no public theater for 1,700 years. 1,700 years we did without theater. Theater became something that was done in, uh, theater became the property of people like, uh, of the intelligentsia, and plays were done only in libraries. The masses were just given spectacles. Uh, when Christianity took over, they certainly didn't want uh, anything about the theater, in, in the theater in a Christian civilization, because theater is always about the ma the slave making fun of the master. <laughs> theater is always subversive. Theater is always about there to question the way that you think, to challenge your beliefs. And so Christianity wanted nothing to do with that. And what saved it all? And then there were nuns in convents who wrote plays modeled after Terence. And but theater became for from the first century B.C until the, the 16th century, there was no theater. It was kept alive, probably, we don't know, by strolling players, by these actors who were just Comedia, playing, Comedia, yeah. who were just playing the plots of their plays, making them up and traveling around Europe and Asia. Until one day in Spain, Lope, I'm really simplifying this, but it's, the, it's through, Lope de Vega and Calderon started copying down what they were saying. No wonder Lope de Vega could write 1,500 plays. And then those <laughs> plays started filtering over into England which suddenly under Elizabeth had a, a solid government. and People were learning to speak for the first time. Just imagine for the first time in Elizabethan England, 
when they came to the Globe, people have been coming, they've been hearing mystery plays, you know, plays about miracles and about things from, from scenes from the Bible. But for the first time with Christopher Marlowe and all, and they started hearing a common language and a culture was born. And it took that 1,700 years, but we can never forget that 1,700 years because that's how perilous the theater is. All I can say is we have to find ways to protect it because we are, as somebody said yesterday, the American Empire could vanish like that. I read in the Aspen <laughs> Times this morning. But the American, and the theater, theater is gonna happen. The, the theater could vanish. And we have to face up to that. It's not going to because as Herb Gardner, who was a wonderful playwright, wrote a play called The Thousand Clowns. He just said, with all this media stuff, he said, you know, theater, that's the medium without the knobs. <laughs> <laughs> And I love that. You, just, you don't have to turn it on. You're just yeah. there. It's there on a platform. It doesn't cost any money to do it. We could put a play on right here. Kim Rosenstock, who's a wonderful playwright right here. One of my students from Yale is here. We could, she has a play that we could do right here. In this it would be so much, entertain you so much more than the blather that we're dropping off here. Yeah. I, I we, want to open up to, to questions in a second, but I want just a real quick question to Carrie because uh, later uh, Rocco Landison is going to talk about some of his plans at the NEA for urban art centers. Do you want to talk a little bit about what's happening in the Tenderloin, or you're trying to get happen to the Tenderloin in San Francisco? Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's one of the strange phenomenons, and you know, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, that the center of San Francisco is this totally blighted neighborhood for lots of reasons. Um, called the Tenderloin, and we're about two blocks from it. And when I when I got to ACT and, and, and the Geary was ruined, you know, lay in ruins, and we were in diaspora all over town, I was looking at all these ruined vaudeville houses that lay along Market Street and thinking what San Francisco must have been like and why that had happened. And I had watched Cora Cahan do this Come. amazing project on 42nd Street in New York that I so admired. This sort of public-private partnership that had the New Victory Theater, this children's theater allied with Disney that was doing The Lion King. And there was a whole kind of ecology of stuff on that block, rehearsal studios, the roundabout theater, that really turned around 42nd Street. And I thought, for years I kept thinking in San Francisco, surely somebody will do this with the Tenderloin. Um, and then our mayor, you know who, um, well, you know our mayor. Um, his wife is actually an actress. Well, that's the good news. Um, who went to ACT, and it's really wonderful. And there, she said, well, I think Gavin's legacy should be finally to do something about mid-market. And this is a very interesting moment where suddenly this is alive everywhere. The Ford Foundation, we hasn't been in the theater business in a long, long time, um, is getting back into to sort of capital funding of blighted neighborhoods as art zones. And then I started reading what Rocco was interested in at the NEA and that HUD was involved in this, which is always really interesting to me when these diff totally different government agencies are starting to collaborate to try and figure out, could you take that part of mid-market of the Tenderloin in San Francisco and make it, and which is a totally blighted area, and make it a really vibrant, art zone, which I have longed for because we have a school for young people and we need housing and, and I want to do a thing with the Unified School District and, and, and do classics and rep where school kids can come and we can have classrooms there and make it one whole sort of big campus. And um, that has suddenly become a much bigger part in the middle of the recession where there's no money for anything, has become a big part of the dialogue in San Francisco, at least, which is about how different arts groups can collaborate. What about training? What do you do with so many young art students? Who It's a very expensive city to live in. How do you house them? But more importantly than that, how can you make a, buildings that are transparent? Have any of you seen the new Alvin Ailey Studios and building in New York on 56? That is such a great template of what an arts building should look like, which is it's totally transparent. So you can stand across the street at Starbucks with your coffee and watch those dancers rehearse. So if you don't know anything about dance, you are welcomed into this incredibly magical world. That's the kind of art spaces we should have in our urban environment. So Rob is going to make this happen. Yeah. So, uh, uh, now, do we have some questions from the audience? We have, we have two microphones. And so uh, when you get the microphone, you know, go, you know, go ahead and just you know, uh, tell us who you are, and, because we, you're going to be on film, and then ask the question. And try to have the question, as we say, end with a question mark. Uh, first of all, hi everybody, thank you. You guys are fantastic, this is a wonderful panel. Um, my name is James Ludwig and uh, I'm actually an equity actor, a professional actor working here at Theater Aspen this summer with Jay Sandridge. Um, I, I also have a master's degree and uh, moved right to New York 17 years ago and have been lucky enough to make my living as an actor for that entire time. But I'm also, uh, one of the things you guys mentioned today which is kind of 
popped a flag in my brain was, uh, Carrie, you mentioned distribution, which I think is interesting. And, and then John, you said uh, theater is the, you know, that Herb Gardner said theater is the medium without the knobs. Um, I'm also uh, an act, uh, a member of the National Council of Actors Equity. I'm a counselor, which is the, we are the governing body of the union, the actors union. And I'm the chair of the Equity New Media Committee. Mm. It's a committee that I formed. I started this committee, I walked into council and said, there are, there are new mediums coming at us all the time. We have to be ahead of this curve. And Dana Ivey looked at me and said, what, what? what are you going to help people with their computers? What? Um, so so we, we got this. Your question. Yeah, I know. We got this committee started. And there is a theater that has come to us with a proposal for cinecasting. This theater shall remain nameless. They want to cinecast in theaters, like movie theaters, 500 movie theaters around the country, their entire season. I know that theater is a live person in front of a live audience, but how do you guys, as artists, feel about putting plays into movie theaters? It's, not, it's, no, longer, it's no longer a play. It works, with, strangely, it works with the Met. Peter Gelb at the Met has started putting opera into theaters. And, it's, and Nick Heitner is doing it at the National. And the National, and the national, the national has done only... A, What's interesting about that is that they are records. They're only done a few. They're done for big hits. Uh, I still think that uh, it's still not the same experience as seeing Helen Mirren in Fedra on stage at the National. We are see, they're cashing in on her celebrity uh, to generate. It's I think it's a purely uh, a, a purely uh, commercial proposition. Strangely, almost every show that has a little run is taped, videoed by Lincoln Center and it exists. All you have to do is go to Lincoln Center and you can see, you can see a play. It can't but be shown, but, but, it, but, but what it does, I just want to say, but all it is is it's a record of what that play looked like. It is in no way approximate the emotional experience of that play. But you know, uh, this question about media and theater, we're never going to get away from it. It's important. I, you know, I, I, I didn't, I haven't loved the Cinecast experience that much, but I'm not so much of a film person. But I do think media is going to be incredibly valuable, both as a tool for making theater, which has already proved to be true, and as a tool for recording theater. I, I just went to a really interesting panel on this where a guy who runs on the boards in Seattle is recording sort of experimental theater pieces and just streaming them. And so people all over the world who haven't had a chance to see that theater artist live at least get to know what the material is. It's funny that we're so protective of it. Theater's a very, very highly protective, unionized art form. I just made a piece with dancers and actors, and we wanted to tape it to send because we're going to tour it. And I, our union doesn't permit that. And the dancers were flummoxed that they weren't allowed to do that because that's how they let the world know about their work. So this is an ongoing dialogue in our field about reproduction. Big question. But that's going to be that what you're saying is going to be is a question that we cannot be solved. That time will take care of that. Time but will manifest right itself. Question. But it's no. the right you know, question. At the, when, when I was chairing the NEA and we wanted to do you know free educational materials to students, just little clips of live things, almost impossible with the union that's situation. That's changing a lot. Yeah, and, and you really you know just it, you lost the opportunity to build a new audience. Do we have any questions on this side of the of the room or? Okay, well, this is, this is the inquisitive side here. I'm just, you know, uh, uh, so. Rocco has a question. We have to Hi, I'm Richard Long. Um, we live in New York, and my wife and I go every Thursday night to the theater, and it's true that most, and most of it's off-Broadway theater that we go to, and most of it are younger, uh, older people because the tickets are now $90 for an off-Broadway play. But every August, they have the Fringe Festival, that goes on for three weeks where every ticket's $15. And it has all different types of, I mean, there's probably about 20 venues in small theaters, some larger theaters. And it's, you can barely get a ticket to some of them, even if you show, if you show up late. But that's the spirit of Chino, the spirit of Joe Chino. <laughs> but I'm wondering, you see fringe festivals uh, that are sprouting out up all over the place now. There's one in Boulder. Might that not, could that be, you know, the future of the theater yeah. is to is to encourage uh, local communities that you can start your own fringe type festival, First, yeah, and and get more participation from young people that way. First of all, bundling things is always a good idea because multiple things are happening at once and there's sort of heat around it. The other thing is it may be that buildings, big theater buildings, is not part of the future 
you know, that we may have to explode these buildings. You know, the 19th century was a culture of high, high art. My theater is this beautiful 1910 Beaux-Arts building. You walk in and it's gilded and it's fantastic. But that may not be, you know, my feeling, you know, for the next 50 years, who's ever going to come in and run ACT, is that's only going to be one part of what ACT is going to be. If that theater doesn't somehow get out and perform all over town, in other kinds of venues, it will probably end up being irrelevant because we're not, th those buildings are no longer transparent. They're no longer very welcoming. It's not the kind of environment. I think right now, because we're very lonely people who sit behind computer screens all day, people are more hungry for intimacy than for big things. And so s small venues are going to be important. People are doing theater in non-traditional venues all over the place. Let's talk about the Catholic Church. There's nobody going anymore. Those churches should all be theaters. We should take them all. And make them theaters. So, I, I, you know, I think there are lots of, I think the relationship of geography to theater is going to be a big one and interesting in this country. Now, Rocco, did you have a question? I'd like to follow up, follow up on something that, uh, that John said, which is that our national theater now really is, our, is are the collection of resident theaters across the country. And address this to you, Carrie, which, and it really is a question because I don't have the answer to it. I don't know which is what's happened to the resident theater movement in the United States. When it was started largely by the Ford Foundation, a little bit of input from the NEA, Mac Lowry. Um, you had these you know, mythic artistic directors. You, 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 know, you had Joe, Joe Papp and Tyrone Guthrie and Zelda and uh, Bob Brewston and Gordon Davidson, et cetera. Now, many of these theaters, many theaters across the country are run by their managing directors and their, and their, and their boards. <laughs> and. Uh, where you had a situation where subsidy was supposed to protect uh, a theater's ability to, uh, to be bold, to experiment, to have conservatories, to do repertory. Most of that has gone out the window. There was a season not long ago where we, at Jujamson, put, put Caroline or Change on Broadway. In the same season, an institutional theater did Pajama Game. What has happened? Uh, what, is, is this economic? Is it cultural? What has happened? Because something has happened. Well, it's a fantastic question that's a huge one to answer, but I think there, there are three things. One is our own sense of value, right, as, as theater makers. As the culture has moved towards a kind of obsession with a certain kind of short-term celebrity, and, and, and we know this in the business world, that profit, that, that success is measured by your quarterly profit. Art just doesn't work that way. You know, as John said, you know, it might take three years to make a play. It may, might take three weeks to make a play. The real genius of Joe Papp, who taught all of us, it was my first job in the theater, was that he would produce a play and it failed and he'd say to the playwright, we're doing your next play. That's great producing. It's to say, over the long term, we make an investment in this artist, right? I, I you know, not, oh my God, it isn't a hit, you know, we're going to move on. That's what's happened now. Now, it's partly the media, it is partly the press. Everybody is desperate for that New York Times review that's going to, you know. Um, it's partly um, the devaluing of a sense of the craft of making theater. So I wish, this is my wish for the, my big idea for the theater, if there were a philanthropist sitting in this room who could do one big thing, fund acting companies, resident ensembles of actors, at theaters around the country. This is how theater always got made. Zelda Fitchander, where I grew up at Arena Stage, that was Robert Prosky, all these great actors lived in Washington. So they were part of that community. They knew that community. She built plays around those actors. They were transformative. So when an audience went to see it, they weren't seeing celebrity typecast into one role. They were seeing transformation. We now have dissolved acting companies around the country. We all only try to hire a film star who's going to sell tickets. And in the short run, it might sell tickets. In the long run, it does absolutely no good. I am totally convinced this is not the way to go. But it means it's a really different model, and you have to fight for it in, in the long run. And I think it's a very different uh, philanthropic sense. And it's, a, it's communities demanding that their theaters actually be part of their community and not accepting their theaters being rental houses. All of you who live around the country who have big theaters in your community that just rent work that comes in from New York, don't accept that. It's your community. You're paying for it. These are your citizens. It should be work that speaks to you. Uh, I want to ask a real quick question. Uh, John, you have a new play opening this okay, fall at that. Lincoln Center. Would you like to, could you tell us something about it? It's a free well, man of color. It's a play that was commissioned by George Wolfe a few years ago. Uh, he, he asked me he wanted to write a play about, for, it's a great uh, American actor who's not well known enough named Jeffrey Wright. 
and uh, he, we wanted to write a play for Jeffrey that would be classical and it would be about American, I had written a play about American history called, uh, about the, a comedy about the death of Ulysses S. Grant that George liked very much. And he said, do you want to go back into American history? Anyway, it took me two years just on the strength of a, uh, you know, the promise of a production, of a commission from uh, the public theater, which George was then running, uh, I wrote this play. And uh, so it's had a very rocky road. It has a big, it has a cast. And I'll tell you one of the things I do perversely, I hate one-man shows. <laughs> I hate two-man shows. I love, my, this play has got 25 actors in it. But it's and, brilliant. And, uh, and so I've defiantly written a play that could not be done commercially. And so Lincoln Center and, and the public theater found a way not to be able to do it. And, uh, and now uh, we, uh, South Pacific closes at the end of August. And we start a couple of weeks later. And we open uh, at the Beaumont uh, uh, in the, uh, in, in the uh, we start playing in, we start rehearsals in September, start playing in October. But that is because I am lucky I mean, one of the tragedies of a, a playwright like Tennessee Williams was when his hits started drying up, he didn't belong any place. Mm -hmm. He had no home. In about 1969, uh, people said he keeps writing the same play over and over. And he wrote a play that was so brilliant and different called The Bar of a Tokyo Hotel. And I went to see it was just a whole, and the play was, Crucified. They said, Tennessee, why isn't he writing like he used to write? And the, the destruction of that play, in a sense, he didn't know where he was completely lost. Uh, even a, a, a playwright like Arthur Miller has, does, has not, did not have a theater at the end of his life mm. that he could call mm. a home. Mm. And I am lucky, because I've done now five or six plays at, uh, at Lincoln Center, that, and they helped me. I mean, they, they took this play over. Uh, uh, and as you know, the Guthrie was willing to chip in too. You know, if, if we needed help, but I, because I felt I had a home there uh, that could support a play with 25 actors, and so I am very, very lucky. I'm one of those rare birds that feels, in some way, I have a home at Lincoln Center Theater and at the Signature Theater on 42nd Street, for which I've written three plays. And uh, because they said, here's the space, write a play for us. Write a play right now. And I did that. And that's one of the, they, people say, where do you get your ideas to write plays? One of the best ways to get an idea to write a play is to have a producer say, here's a stage. Write here's a, a date. Here's a yeah. date. It's what the O'Neill, the O'Neill started that way where they would pick the player out and you would be given a date. And, uh, it, and I wrote House of Blue Leaves for that date, you know, to be, <laughs> to be done at that time. Uh, it was that goose that you, that you needed. Uh, the reality of a, of a, I'm just sorry, completely selfishly, how a writer yeah. finds his theater that he belongs to uh, in a sense that uh, the way that David Mamet in Chicago beginning found a theater with Gregory Moshe at the Goodman and the Step and Steppenwolf were there. Where but they John also gives back to, I mean, the thing that's sort of unique about you, and I, this goes back to artists need to be part, people of the theater, is you also run the Lincoln Center Review. You write for them. He's an amazing artist to have inside a theater. He'll talk to any donor. He uh, talks to the audience. I mean, there's a sense that you're part of the whole fabric well, of the organization. Well, a playwright is not somebody. You know, a novelist right. can... A novelist can sit aside and sit in his, his or her room and write, and then mail the book out, you know, and then wait for it to come back from the end. But, you know, when you finish a play and it's ready to go out to the world, you have a completely, the playwright has a completely different relationship to his work. In a sense, the playwright becomes mayor of this village. Because there will be, uh, I mean, when, when my play opens at Lincoln Center, you know, there will be approximately... 50 or 60 people backstage, on, on stage and on off stage. And it's my obligation, I feel, to keep the temperature of that production alive when it's running, you know, to know what's happening. I feel that a, a play, a play, you have to keep going, checking on the play, listening to the audience's response to it, that a playwright, a playwright has a much more visceral relationship to his work in the present than, uh, than a novelist does, where the, play, mm. the book is just there mm. in the window and you're waiting for its, its sales on, on, on Amazon. So to find a theater where you're allowed, that allows you to have that relationship with your own work it's great. is yeah. great. And I am almost abashed that I am so lucky to, uh, one of the reasons I did that is that I, the happiest, one of the happiest moments I had 
a number of years ago was with, withdrawing from the Writers Guild of America, so I would never be tempted to write another film script again, because that was just like a bottomless pit that was, uh, that was just absorbing, yep. taking things away. We're going to end, I know. Yeah. But uh, that we have so much to talk about that is of interest to me and to Carrie that I'm so honored and happy that you came here and just saw the glimmerings of the theater at this extraordinary time in our current history and culture, economically, uh, where we stand financially, but also with all the media at our disposal. As Mr. Ludwig said, you know, where do we put, uh, where, does the, where is the line drawn? It's a thrilling time to be in the theater. I think we have time for one quick question, but it'll only come from an Aquarian. One. Okay. Uh, and I think this, this film There's a playwright right there. There's a playwright right there, okay. Dana. Oh, wait, he's, he's holding oh. the microphone, this poor man. This fellow, we've, we've gone back and forth. We've been playing with him for the whole game. I, th okay. I think we really... Okay, uh, go ahead. Hi, my name is Kim no. Rosenstock, and um, I just want to say John Guerra is an amazing teacher as well. He taught me at Yale, and he is the, one of the most generous, amazing playwrights. I think young playwrights are really lucky to have people like John giving all their time to us. Um, my question for you guys is, how do you feel that um, the current state of, and I know this is opening a whole can of worms, and we only have a few seconds, the current state of um, theater criticism is affecting the future of the American theater right now and the way that the, the New York Times sort of has this really great power in determining how audiences will respond or how audiences are willing to take risks to come see new works. You know, the funny thing is that, that critics, I mean, even with the Times, you know, because the media, that whole media is in so much trouble, we're in this insane blogosphere where you, you do the first preview of a play and before the lights go out, everybody's on Twitter telling everybody what they thought about it. It's so wild. And then, you know, in the morning, our market, I never look at this stuff in the marketing department to write and say, well, this is what, you know, what we heard. I, I thought, wow. It's partly horrifying and it's partly kind of liberating because that sense, we have the most horrifying criticism in San Francisco because it all comes down to an icon of a little man who sits on a chair clapping. That's all. Nobody reads the review. They just see what the little man is doing. <laughs> it's so deeply humiliating. Um, but that's what it comes down to. But now that everybody's a critic, I, you but, know, you I know, think it's sort of shifted. Not, but it's all, no, I don't think, because I think that it's, <laughs> All the question's always been, how does the artist relate to the critical reception? <clears throat> and I think how you live, I, when I was a kid, a place where I still live, the man across the street had a play on Broadway. It ran nine performances, but I didn't care. He had a play on Broadway. But opening night, the reviews were so horrible, he got in bed for the rest of his life and never got out. <laughs> and I realized that c cannot happen to me. And you know, I have had reviews, I mean, the first review I got in New York, they said, this is not a review, it's an obituary, you know. <laughs> and after that, I stopped reading reviews. One of the roles of being a playwright is how the world of criticism is over there. We're going to know what it is that they say, but if we read it and try to learn from it, uh, I don't know what it has to tell us. I don't know what it has. In a sense, when the more expensive theater becomes, criticism becomes consumer report. Is it worth spending the money? This and how we, how we live, and how, as a writer, as a novelist, as any writer, how we live in spite of our reviews. And it goes back to, just one more thing, you know, that the, the real task, and it's the hardest thing to do in this instant culture, is to try and believe that, to look at the long view and think this is how people like Beckett survived when everybody said Waiting for Godot was not a play and a disaster and Harold Pinter and the birthday party was to sort of say, in the long run, what's the trajectory? And, and the rest is just white noise, you know? Uh, thank you, Carrie Perloff. Thank you, John Guerra. <laughs> thank you. Okay, babe. Thank you.